Hello, good morning. Today our guest is Spencer J. Quinn and we're going to be doing a part two of our recently concluded interview. So when we ended the prior interview, Spencer, you were talking about John Stuart Mills and his writings on stability in Asia and disruption in Europe. And we're going to continue with that topic. So you may go ahead. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, so if I remember correctly, in On Liberty, Stuart, John Stuart Mill was, was talking about how the Chinese in particular have um, high intelligence, but maybe not so much genius. And that enables them to have a more stable society, which is very peaceful and good, but also maybe not very good for adapting to new stimuli. Whereas in Europe, there is less, there's more turbulence, but there's also more how it describes it. And I think this might, um, I, I don't know how, how accurate that would be today, but I think it does dovetail into the idea of IQ where the Asian peoples like the Chinese and the Japanese have a higher average IQ than Europeans, but they have a smaller standard deviation. And so therefore they, they don't have quite as few many, proportionally as many geniuses as the Europeans do. The Europeans have a slightly lower average IQ, but a higher or yeah, a standard deviation, you know, greater proportional number of geniuses, but also a greater proportional number of, of uh, you know, people on the lower end of the IQ spectrum, which also uh, will could play into your your idea of disturbance or turbulence in, 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 in among the European people that you find less of um, in Asia, although you do find it there as well. Europeans are higher in openness and individualism, and I like to cite this as you can always consult Yuri Alik. Richard Lynn has done articles on the topic, and he cites credible people. Right. Joseph Henrich wrote a book, The Late Trying This, Harry Trying This. He was an expert on individualism, and Gert Ofsted also wrote on individualism. So we have data on the topic and openness Great. is correlated with creativity so this could be one reason for the higher levels of creativity in western societies and then some people are interested in the genetic correlate correlates of novelty seeking and they argue that the west is also higher in novelty seeking and distance from africa is co positively related to novelty seeking right did you ever read um kevin mccann's book about individualism, um, let me see if I find it. What it's called? It's uh, individualism and the, Western the liberal Western. tradition. Yeah, did you read that? So I've read a lot of Kevin McDonald's articles and stuff, but I'm yet to read that book. I haven't purchased it as yet, but I've read several reviews, but I haven't read it as yet. Right, I haven't either. I've read Culture of Critique and, and Cultural Insurrections, but I have not read that one yet. That's probably next on my list for him. But Richard. Ricardo Duchine, he had he has some articles praising and critiquing McDonald's. So as I said, I've read a lot of reviews, but I need to buy the book physically. But McDonald's, it's an interesting book because McDonald gets into arguments like pathological altruism. Right. So it would be a, a, a good read. But what's fascinating, Spencer, is that it is not only people in the dissident academic community like Richard Lane and Edward Dutton were arguing that Asians are not as creative. I've interviewed mainstream academics on this show, and I've read them who share similar positions. Great, yeah. Yes, even professors will say to me that their Asian students are bright, but you can't engage them in a conversation. They don't think. They're good at mathematics and passing their tests, but to be philosophical, no, that's not Asians. Interesting. One, are they saying this to you on the QT? Or is this public knowledge? Well, well, some of it is in obscure journals and some of it is public knowledge like on my show. Okay. And what's also intriguing is that academics, even recent papers are saying that China is yet to develop a culture that's truly theoretical. So we still don't have a Chinese philosophy of international relations. Right. Well, let me ask you a question. Did you ever read the um, the history of the Peloponnesian War? No, that's one of the only reviews. I have not read that book. Only reviews. I haven't read it as yet. That very ancient text, no. Well, no, this is written by Thucydides. Yeah, and... that's why I say it's ancient. Oh, I thought you said Asian. It's no, ancient. no, it's ancient. Right, got it. No, you're right. 
So um, the interesting thing was that you had, you know, starting with Athens and Athens was the creative, um, uh, they had all the creative people, all the geniuses, and they had all this, this marvelous culture that, you know, still lives today, et cetera. Whereas the Spartans, they were just tough guys. You know, they were, they were just a militaristic society where they, where they were more communal and less individualistic than Sparta. And the two went to war, like, you know, for like a better part of a century. And eventually Sparta won. And despite the fact that you had, um, despite the fact that you had all the creativity and genius in Athens, and I, you know, it's, it's China, although I, I got to say there was a plague in Athens, so that might have had something to do with it. But um, with China, I think things look good for them, despite the fact that they might not have the same level of creativity, because when you got a billion, 1.4 billion people, the bell curve just is going to tell you, you're going to have creative people among them. You're going to have geniuses among them because it's just so many folks, number one. And number two, they, they are ethnocentric and they seem to be on the right track. So for example, exploring this ethnocent and ethnocentrism. So for example, in the book that I love to just laud and, and promote is called The Neuroscience of Intelligence by Richard Hayer. And I wrote a, a review of this great book. And uh, it just goes on to, it talks about intelligence, but he talks also about how the Chinese have figured out that genetics is linked to intelligence and they have labs and labs and labs and a lot of um, resources put into the scientific exploration of this. One day they're gonna figure something out in a way to enhance intelligence genetically. And they're, do they're on their way to doing that right now. This is not a conspiracy theory because this is what I'm learning in this is public knowledge, or at least according to Richard Hare. And um, that's good for them. It may not be good for the rest of us, I don't know. But uh, they just, even though that they might lack that creativity, I think with large enough numbers, it won't matter. And it's also public knowledge that ethnocentric groups are more likely to win war. That's also public knowledge yeah. from evolutionary psychology. Well, so people he... who are literate in that sort of thing is public knowledge. But to your typical, uh, you know, white Democrat, they're going to probably say, oh, no, push it on. that's not true. You know, but according to the people who know better, yes, you're right. It is public knowledge. Literally. So, you know, some defenders of America, usually older white men would say, when we compare America to China, China as an intellectual property deficit, China in terms of military spending is a, is a paper tiger. But the Chinese are passionate about China. Chinese soldiers are not being taught critical anti-Chinese race theory. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, we are uh, dithering because our leadership is stupid. Our, our leadership is uh, controlled with either silly people or hostile people. And they are, we're dithering, we're, we're wasting our resources and we're, we're basically, as my dad would say, pissing away our advantages because we don't know any better. I, you know, I mean, the thing is, is that you have men who are dedicated to building civilizations and maintaining them, but these men become useless once uh, a, a civilization has already uh, reached the top. And at that point, you can flood the, the, the avenues of power with people who are uh, less dedicated to this sort of civilizational development because civilization doesn't need development anymore. It's running on autopilot. So pretty much anybody can be in charge. And then once that happens, they start making mistakes. And I mean, the Romans did this, the Byzantines did this. I mean, the Ottomans in, in the 19th century. I mean, like any great society is gonna go through these cycles where you just have weak, um, either hostile or, uh, or short-sighted men and women who are in charge of these societies and they just they don't understand what's important and they make mistakes and, that, yeah. I mean, and the chinese are making fewer mistakes than we are yes i don't know why academics and educators in the united states would argue that science or mathematics is racist or that we need an emancipatory mathematics that will yes. not help american warfare i get your point but yes it's just so crazy well, but the thing is, you are taking the enemy at its word. Never do that. You see, yet they say math is racist. Yeah, that's ridiculous, obviously. But no, to say math is racist is just a way for non-whites who are math, i.e. blacks, are able to increase influence for themselves. That's, it. that's all they're doing. It's not about what they're saying. Remember, take the enemy at its word. 
That's why, you know, at its word, and you see what they're saying as a bid for power without having to gain it. Everything makes sense. Yes, you to know? marginalize whites. Sorry? To marginalize whites. Yes, to, to make us, to take influence away from whites and give it to people who don't deserve it, frankly. And that's why I said, well, it's, it's going to be a bit tricky, but that's why I said earlier that elite blacks may benefit, but ordinary working class blacks who believe this nonsense are essentially useful idiots because they're not going to benefit. They're not going to get the grants or the fellowships. But they're not going to benefit from anything anyway. <laughs> I mean, I mean uh, it's, 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 it's the, what they would gain or lose, is, it's, it's so, it's so when it comes to like mathematical talent or whatever. I mean, it, it might as well be going to the moon, you know? I mean, in my mind, it's not, that's not really important for them as space. To have their territory, you know, th those are the number one and two things. Everything else is, whatever comes in third is a distant third, in my opinion. Four, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. that, that's what they care about. You know, Spencer, in your piece on the importance of IQ, you shared um, an, a significant, a really important study by Michael Vaughn of St. Louis University from 2012, right. and he's talking about MA, OA promoters, and this is linked to self-regulation and self-control. And yeah. you write, Wade offered a study led by Michael Vaughn of the St. Louis University from 2012, which demonstrate that 5% of the black men they observed possessed only two of these MA, OA promoters. The researchers then compared the members of this group life histories to those of the blacks with three or four promoters and found that the former group was much more likely to be arrested or imprisoned. Wade notes dry, dryly. The, right. same, the same comparison could not be made in white or Caucasian males, the researchers report, because only 0.1% carried a two promoter allele. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah, that, that's an extremely important study that I learned about uh, reading A Troublesome Inheritance by Richard Wade, um, and Nicholas Wade, excuse me. Um, that's a great book. It's, it's called A Troublesome Inheritance, Genes, Race, and Human History. And that, what you just cited, I think, is on, I have my book right here, because I love the book. It's on page 56. Everybody wants to look it up in the library, page 56. Yeah, the MAOA gene it, in the, it demonstrates how genetics is not only linked to intelligence, but it's also linked to impulse control. And the, 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 this corresponds with how Arthur Jensen and Richard Lynn would scrupulously um, uh, rule out race when they're doing their IQ studies, showing that a black person with an IQ of 110 will do about as well as a white person with the same IQ, uh, you know, in, in, given you know in academia or, or whatever profession they're in. So you can rule out race. It's just that there are fewer blacks with that high IQ, but the ones that do achieve that or have that are able to do just fine. So the blacks that have three or more copies of this allele you know, the MAOA gene, uh, then they're able to suppress their, their, their impulses and they don't go to jail at the same rate that whites don't go to jail. You see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, I don't know if you know, but Nas the National Bureau of Economic Research around 2020 did uh, produce uh, an economic paper that dealt with time preferences and self-control and the results are strikingly similar. Right. It, yeah, people were analyzed based on, well, they weren't analyzed based on race, but references were made to race and the black students expressed lower self-control levels. Right. And uh, you're from the Caribbean, so you probably know about that, the, the study about the candy and the children in the 60s. Yes, there was, a, uh, there was a Trinidadian study in the Caribbean some years ago. Yes, yes. And that's where it first was originated. And then it was repeated in, in, in places like in the United States. And they realized, yeah, that's true. The black children could not, with, could not withstand the temptation of having the candy right away. Whereas the Asian and, and white children were like, sure, I'll take double candy if, you, if I wait a day or a week or whatever it was. And Spencer, I don't know if you agree with me, but recently I wrote an article on patients and we know of really recent studies examining the link between patients and development and civilization is a consequence of time preference 
And this is one reason why Asians were able to modernize so quickly. They, they, they score high, they, they score quite high in on measures of time preference and patience. But they are, yes, I agree. They also have a European model to copy. Yes, but patient is crucial to success. Patient countries, in patient people invest and save more. Patient countries invest more. Patient countries are richer. Agree. You're 100% right. You have um, to think long term. And No, but the thing is, is that you're thinking the way a white or an Asian would think. Now, let's imagine a world where there are no whites, there are no Asians. We only have blacks, Okay. Uh, they would be perfectly happy living in a kind of society that is much more primitive and debased than what we have today. They would be, they they wouldn't know any better. They would think this is fine. They'd be happy there. Yeah, there'd be some there'd be some power, and there uh, some would have power and some wouldn't. There'd be have and have nots, and there'd be wars between tribes uh, quite often, and there'd be slavery and all that stuff. But they wouldn't imagine anything greater, I don't think. Whereas what you're doing is you're imagining greater things, and you're saying. No, we need to have better time preferences and, and we need to, you know, have the, what is it, the, the K life strategy, not the R life strategy. We need to be patient because that's how you build great civilizations. And you talk a lot about humanity. That's great. I agree 100%. But I don't think that the majority of, of Blacks think that way. They don't think it's terms of majority. And, uh, ag- and again, it. Stephen Aber and co-authors just published a paper looking at disparities in world. It's not a paper about race or anything like that, but if you read it carefully, there are racial implications. Because one of the conclusions of the paper is basically that subsistence societies, they're still not wired for a post-industrial world. And today in Africa, many people, they're still living a subsistence lifestyle. They produce goods, I won't even say services, but they produce goods for consumption, for consumption or to sell to family and friends. So the idea of a capitalist society where you're not just embedded in a tribal framework, it's still unusual, even today in the contemporary world. And what's also interesting is that the the descendants of Africans, people in the Caribbean, their cultural traits are still similar. So Jamaica is collectivistic. Barbados is collectivistic. But Barbados is more, it's culturally Igbo. And when you do research on the Igbo people, even when the research is done by people of Igbo descent, they will argue that Igbo people are individualistic and they think long term. So I have argued that this is one explanation for the greater success of Barbados relative to Jamaica, the the strength of the the, the Igbo cultural profile. Yes, this is uh, I'm aware of the Igbo and I'm aware of I had a uh, I read an article that was on Vider by Chanda Chasala, I think his name is. He's an African. Yes, I know him. Right. Um, and uh, he, he mentions the uh, high, um, I, higher IQ of the Igbo. Um, and yeah, sure. I, I, I have no problem. I mean, that seems like it's telling, telling the truth on that. Like I interviewed an Igbo academic and in his name is Paul Igwe. So Paul Igwe wrote a study. And in the study, there's a comment from an Igbo man saying, in Igbo, we think about, in Igbo society, we think about tomorrow. We work, then play. We're not all about entertainment. Okay. Yeah, this is not just an. It may sound sim, It might sound simple, Spencer, but this is not just an okay response. You see, the difference between me and you, Spencer, is that you are white and I am black, and I'm a black person who takes the question of civilization seriously. I don't need to feel good, Spencer. I like to achieve, and I'm from a space where feeling good is just too important, and I don't like it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. I'm with- yeah, there's really more to life than feeling good. So Jamaica celebrated its independence recently, and people were talking about its achievement in sports and entertainment. Yes, but as but as I've always said, many countries have brilliant sports people and entertainers. You can't run a civilization on people entertaining themselves and feeling good. Right. These are the kinds of uh, activities people uh, uh, practice once a civilization has already been established. But such people are not, are much less useful and uh, before a civilization is established. Yes, the yeah, planning is important, and another divergence between Europe and the rest of the world is systematization. So the slave trade, the slave trade isn't unique to European countries, but 
European countries created systems to exploit the process of imperialism. So there was the Dutch West India Company, the Royal African Company, the stock markets, plantations were financed, there were estate attorneys and managers. Europeans created a system to exploit resources that led to wealth. And this is why people would, would argue that slavery was profitable because they're measuring a European system. There, most academics, when they study slavery in non-Western societies, they're not looking at business models. They're not telling us about guides that were created, that were written by enslavers to increase output. Well, so, um, so the, oh, well, you may go ahead. Well, I mean, one thing you have to consider is that the slave trade was run by, say, the British. Okay, um, in the during the colonial period of America, there were at one point more white slaves than blacks. Uh, blacks didn't really come into prominence until I, I believe until the late uh, 17th century. Uh, prior to that, uh, they took the, the 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 nobility or the aristocracy of England was afraid of revolution. In, in, in of their own you know, lower class people. And so they would ship off many poor whites and, or, or would trump up charges against them and, and say either the gallows or you go to Jamaica or to the sugar plantations or whatever. And so they, they shipped off a lot. They went to Barbados. The, many of those laborers went to Barbados. Correct. And Barbados, the word, used to be a verb in England. It used, if you Barbados someone or if someone got bar Barbados, that means they were abducted and taken to the, the Caribbean where they would likely die on a, a sugar plantation. As a matter of fact, I don't know if it's Jamaica or if it was Barbados, but there was uh, uh, the historians knew about a, a, a slave revolt. And for many years, they assumed they were all black slaves. But when they actually dug up the bones and, and inspected it, they, they realized they were white. <laughs> this was in the 1600s, like 1650s or something like that. Um, you know, so there were quite a few uh, white slaves, and that they were replaced mostly by blacks because I'm sorry to have to say this, but they, they blacks made better slaves according to the people of the time. They, they, I'm sorry, but that's no, but you know, look, I, I am laughing, I know I'm laughing. So, black societies were likely to be enslaved because it was easier to procure slaves from Africa. Africa lacked centralized states. The centralized regions in Africa, like Benin, were less likely to export slaves. So, Benin transitioned to legitimate trades earlier than other places in, in Africa. So one is geography and two, back to your argument about blacks making better slaves. Well, as I've often said, in Jama during, slavery in, in, during slavery in Jamaica, the black population was quite rebellious. Many of our slaves came from the Gold Coast. They were Akan slaves. So they were the subject states of the, of the Asante Empire. Empire are people who were usually in conflict with Asante. Asante was more centralized, which was less likely for the Asante people to export their own slaves or to capture Asante slaves. But when J Jamaicans were in slavery, they were rebellious people. They were they complained and they were angry because no one wants to be a slave. Today, they are not slaves, and whenever there's a problem, they talk about the government. Well, I, I have to just say well, I have to say one thing. Slavery, from what I've read, slavery in um, the Caribbean was unbearable. Whereas slavery in the antebellum South, where you're, was much more bearable. And it's not necessarily because but the slave overseers and the owners were, were also very harsh in the Caribbean uh, to the shame of whites. I have to admit that. But at the same time, the sun, the, the tropics, the, the, the uh, climate, made it very difficult to be a slave on a sugar plantation. Whereas being a slave on a cotton plantation in Georgia or Virginia was a lot easier. The climate was, was more comfortable and things were a little laid back and you had better relations between owner and slave in the United States. I can't speak of South America. I haven't studied that. But I do have a question for you. Being from Jamaica, you're familiar with red legs, right? I mean, That's are, Barbados. The red legs are in Barbados, the working class whites in Barbados. Okay, so they're not in Jamaica? No, the, the poor, poor whites in Jamaica, that community was smaller. So in Jamaica, people who are phenotypically white are literally often richer. So Barbados had a larger poor working class. So red legs, that's a, bar, that's a Bayesian issue. I see. Okay. But I, I, there are like, what, 20,000, 30,000 of them? There's very few, but they're still there. 
These are the descendants of white slaves uh, who were sent to uh, the Caribbean in the 17th and 18th century. Yeah, exactly. prisoners of war. So there's much debate as to the extent that whites were in slavery in Barbados. So people like Jerome Andler, he has dismissed the view. However, the Bayesian legislature referred to whites in Barbados as slaves. And these indentured workers could be inherited by the children of planters. So okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit technical, but they weren't treated properly. We know this for sure. Yeah, it was an it was a, an abhorrent time, no doubt about it. I mean, it was awful. Uh, but let me ask you now: you're saying that the Europeans set up this system. I don't know if that system is any. Let me tell me how different was that system to say any system of black on black slavery or the Ottoman. Uh, system okay, so 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 this is the point: Europeans were running a business when they were enslaving Africans. They created a business model. They had formal companies, limited liability companies. They had right. estate managers, planters. They had manuals to teach people how to be productive. That was a system. It was a business. Right. Okay. The non-Western <laughs> world did not have that degree of bureaucracy. Okay, so with the Ottomans, it was more about... It was slavery. You were selling people in slavery, and they worked, and some of the men were usually soldiers, the women concubines. Yes, it was linked to the economy. So if we measure money as a medium of exchange, people would have made a profit. But it wasn't an enterprise. Yeah, okay, I can see that. Yeah, Europeans actually built an enterprise. They were attorneys, people who what the trade that was very business to manage an estate people were writing plantation guides they were professional societies to improve the quality of farming european to the system yeah all right i, I can see that yes yes <laughs> and this is why when we're studying we can say oh slavery contributed to growth in europe it's not that there's a positive relationship between slavery and growth the relationship is actually negative and we have data for colombia brazil africa and america Juta Bolt, she did a study on Africa. She looked at indigenous slavery in Africa. The relationship between slavery and group is negative. Slavery does, does not lead to a positive civil society. But Europeans had better managerial system. It was more business-like. So there, so there were opportun so there were better opportunities to exploit the brutality of slavery. Well, here's a question. This is an academic question then. Um, if slavery doesn't lead to any kind of those kind of benefits that you're talking about why did rome have such a or have such a wide slavery why did egypt have it why did slavery, why did slavery exist everywhere in the world yeah, yeah that, <laughs> if it's such a bad thing that's a quite this is an academic question. yeah well you yeah, know it's an interesting question because slavery is universal even in the smallest and least complicated of societies there were slaves Sure, sure. Uh, until oh. un until quite recently, but I right. think that slavery persisted for such a long time because of our understanding of economics. As I don't remember who said it, but maybe it was C C Karl Marx. I don't want to quote him, but with a slave class, the upper class can invest more time in leisure, so they okay. have time to create and invent and do what in highly intelligent people do when slaves are building monuments and working for free right but yeah, again and this is not this is an issue that people don't speak enough about slavery until recently was universal right i mean the vikings sold yes Flynn and and uh belfast well actually i don't know about belfast but i'm pretty sure Flynn, the city in ireland was originally a slave station for the vikings the vikings would enslave the celts and sell them all wherever they went because they were seafaring so they would go all over the place and sell them wherever they would sell them in russia they would sell them all over the place so, yeah i mean there was uh sla slavery is, a, is is an ancient and universal institution and you know i mean one thing a teacher once told me was that in some ways you can look at slavery as as a mercy and it reminds me of uh, uh, al pacino where He's a gangster and he, he kills one of his rivals and then he goes to the bodyguard of the rival and his Puerto Rican accent and he says, hey, do you want a job, man? You know, because it's like, work for me or I'll kill you. So, of course, the guy's like, yeah, sure, I'll work for you. 
And the thing is, is that, you know, you have one tribe defeats another tribe in war, right? So there's no constitution, there's no law. So the victor goes to spoil. The victor can decide what to do with, with the victims or the, the losers, and they could kill them all and be perfectly just. Or they could say, all right, you people work for us now, and we'll let you live. And, you know, if I were given that, I mean, if I was part of a defeat people, you lost, you know, in a war, and I was given that choice, you know, I would want to, I would, I would take it, even if it didn't work. And so, you know, there's, there's, there's that element of, of this, of slavery that is um, overlooked, because we always, slavery these days is like any other thing coming out of the mouths of the left. It's just a weapon used against whites. So, you know, the fact that the Ottomans had a vast number of slaves and abused them back no, it doesn't matter. The fact that black people black and still do so, only, slavery is only if people practice it because it's it's used as a weapon today. It's not really an honest uh, thing. It's not it's not a historical concept anymore. It's just a weapon. But Spencer, um, Spencer maybe in retrospect, sl- well, I shouldn't even say retrospect, but slavery would have been beneficial to earlier societies. Remember, the concept of being industrious is also quite recent in history. So had it not been for slavery, we would not have those monuments and even industries because it would have been harder to get people to work. Right. For example, uh, Peter the Great sacrificed maybe a half a million serfs, white Russian serfs, in forming his city. You can read about that. I mean, you can, the the city was, it was a, it was a morass. It was a swamp. It was a nothing. He said, I'm building a great city here. And he put Lots of serfs to work over many years, and a, maybe a half a million died as a result of that. And you could find their bones. I mean, like people talk about this now. So yeah, you're right. I mean, you can argue one way or the other. Um, and unfortunately, it's a tragedy. It's part of the tragedy of human of human existence. And um, I I can't say yeah, it's a good thing, but at the same time, Petersburg is a city now. So I can't say that I wish wasn't there right exactly my point so even in india and other parts of the world many monuments were built by forced labor not in in all cases the individuals were not slaves but they weren't doing it out of their own free will exactly yeah but surprising well it's not surprising but unfortunately in western societies if a monument was built by slaves we should just break it down no one cares about indian or other asian monuments they only care about western societies so in the because yeah you can go ahead no no continue please yeah so in the west if a monument was built by slaves it's so bad we have to confront this brutal history of slavery but as you said peter the great the great reformer he usurped to, in, in, in building important monuments. People don't care about that. In India, many of these fanciful monuments were built by forced laborers. Right. According exactly. to archaeologists, farmers built some of the great pr- monuments of Egypt. I don't know if the farmers were forced laborers, but I doubt that they enjoy doing so. Right. And uh, you can also argue about how the Bolsheviks uh, in the Soviet Union, you ex in the gulags, that's slave labor for, and yet you have people in power uh, in America who are Bolsheviks, who are Antifa, who are, you know, uh, identify with communism, and yet communism was responsible for a great number of slaves in living memory. And Spencer, what time are you going to leave? Yeah, I probably should take off right now. Yeah, okay, um, okay, all, all, all right. But speaking to you has been great. We should do it again. Yes, I, I really appreciate you having me on. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Yeah, and next time when you're on, we can talk about the book, your book review of Steven Sanderson's book. Oh, yes, that was a very good book. Uh, it came out recently. Uh, all right, bye, Spencer. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.